It's time for security now. Steve Gibson is here. My goodness, what would you do if your if you found out your washing machine was uploading 3.6 gigabytes of data every single day? Why would that be? Well, Steve's got a good solution. We'll find out which browser is now totally dominant in the world, and then we'll find out what Google's doing to protect your privacy and still get advertisers the information they need to target you. Is that possible? Stay tuned. Security Now is next. This show is brought to you by Cisco Meraki. Without a cloud managed network, businesses inevitably fall behind. Experience the ease and efficiency of Meraki's single platform to elevate the place where your employees and customers come together. Cisco Meraki maximizes uptime and minimizes loss to digitally transform your organization. Meraki's intuitive interface, increased connectivity, and multi site management keep your organization operating seamlessly and securely wherever you're team is. Let Cisco Meraki's 24-7 available support help your organization's remote, on-site, and hybrid teams always do their best work. Visit meraki.cisco.com slash twit. Podcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. This is Security Now with Steve Gibson, episode 957, recorded Tuesday, January 16th, 2024. The Protected Audience API. Security Now is brought to you by Collide. When you go through airport security, there's one line where the TSA checks your ID, and then there's another line where the machine scans your bag. Well, the same thing happens in enterprise security. But in, instead of passengers and luggage, it's end users and their devices. Well, here's the problem. These days, most companies are pretty good at the first part of the equation. They check user identity. Maybe you're using Okta. It makes sure that you you know, are who you say you are. But problem is, once they've authenticated the user, the device just rolls right, th right through without getting inspected. In fact, <laughs> sad to say, 47% of companies allow unmanaged, untrusted devices in to access their data. And that's bad news. An employee can log in from a laptop with no firewall turned on or maybe a laptop with an OS that hasn't been updated in months or <clears throat> a uh, copy of Plex that is well out of date and fully insecure. Or worse, that laptop might belong to a bad actor using employee credentials. Collide solves the device trust problem. Collide, K-O-L-I-D-E, -E, ensures no device can log into your Okta-protected apps unless it passes your security checks. And this is the best part. You can use Collide on devices without MDM. That means your Linux fleet, your contractor devices, every BYOD phone and laptop in your company. This is a great solution. Visit collide.com slash security now. Watch a demo. See how it works. K-O-L-I-D-E dot com slash security now. It's time for security now. Normally, Steve would be over my left shoulder here, but he's actually over to my right because, or as he meant left, he's oh. over there. He's right. over there. <laughs> it's uh, I'm here in, uh, in Rhode Island in my mom's house and visiting mom and Steve's at his house. And we are going to do the show from here. But the good news is the quality continues on. Steve Gibson, hello. Hello, Leo. Great to be with you wherever you are. Yeah. In the, it's in, snowed in, here. In the snow where it's already it's, getting dark because you're yeah. in the northern latitudes. Yeah, you don't want to. Yeah, this is no. it snowed and then it rained and it turned into slush and now it's going to freeze. And it's uh, just, oh boy. Yeah. Arctic chill. You're so, in beautiful Southern California where it's always perfect. I am, and there's no indication that I'll be leaving anytime soon, so uh, I Good. won't have to Good. change any of my cabling. So, okay, t today's topic, today's title is one of the driest sounding titles in a while. Uh, this is Security Now, podcast 957 for uh, January 16th, 2024, titled The Protected Audience API. Well, Which that sounds fascinating. Begs many questions. What is the audience being protected from? Right. And what do they need an API for? Right. <laughs> okay. So we're going to explain all that. But first, we're going to examine what an IoT device that had been taken over would look like and do. What would happen to the target of the attacks 
that it might participate in, what serious problem was recently discovered in a new post-quantum algorithm? Oops. And what does that mean? What does a global map of web browser usage reveal? And after some entertaining thoughts and feedback from our listeners and describing the final touch, I think it's going to be final, that I'm putting on Spinrite, we're actually going to rock everyone's world. Oh and I'm not kidding. By examining and mostly understanding what Google has been up to for the past three years, why it is going to truly change everything we know about the way advertisements are served to web browser users and what it all means for the future. Uh, and this the, the way we kind of got to this podcast today is odd because I thought I had a, an idea for what I was going to talk about this week. And I mentioned that I had an idea last week. Then when I got into it yesterday, I thought, oh, no, this doesn't really, this is not going to work. So, you know, the guy was uh, uh, in the law. And, and so, but that dragged me into what he was looking at, which was completely like, what? What is Google talking about? So then I thought, okay, I can't even talk about that. After I'd invested rather significantly <laughs> in getting ready to talk about that, I thought, okay, no. So then I was upset, and I moved it from being what we would talk about into just an item. But then when I tried to sort of massage it into away from being our main topic into just a news item, then I thought, oh, I think I kind of understand this. So then I moved it back into our main topic and expanded <laughs> it further, and it took up pretty much all the air of the podcast. So I'm already tired, uh, but <laughs> just the uh, explanation is exhausting. <laughs> <laughs> but believe me, this one. And as I was writing this, I was thinking, okay, as soon as this thing gets produced uh, and, and is posted, I need to point Jeff Jarvis at it because oh. this is going to wind him up. I mean, in a good way. He's going to because you know Jeff likes to understand things, and he yeah. keeps telling us how non-technical he is. Well, <laughs> everybody's going to understand this, and. This is really important. Is this the sequel to what Google's doing with killing third-party cookies and what was it, Flock and Topics and all the different things they were trying to do to make yes. ads viable without invading yes. privacy? Okay. Yes. So yes. it's it, and and you, it sounds like you think pretty highly of it. Uh, it's going to happen, and yeah. and what is I think the most surprising thing is that the good news is. You know, Tim Berners-Lee is not in a grave for, from which he, he 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 could roll over or turn over. No, in fact, he's um, very actively running he's looking the World Wide Web Consortium. Uh, yeah. But but what Google has done to their browser, and they did this last summer. This has been active since July of last year. What they have done is astonishingly huge. And and by the end of this podcast, our listeners are going to understand how the world has changed, and we just haven't woken up to it yet. Yeah. I, well, this obviously sounds like something everybody should listen to. This is the argument, by the way. We have this argument a lot on Windows Weekly about why there shouldn't be just a monoculture with 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 uh, browsing because it gives Google uh, outweighed. Uh, importance in all of this well uh, the good news is that the, of course everything they're doing is open source so firefox will end up incorporating this ah, okay. into it so so what google has essentially our browsers used to be html renderers right what they what this turns our browser into is an ad auctioning server it oh, is no. a I know, Leo. It is it is huge. It is, oh, but boy. but it's the it's the only way for Google to deliver what they want yeah. and what we demand. Okay, good. And I mean, I, this I, is interesting. Yeah, this, but is, this is this is a this is a seminal podcast. All right, we're gonna have to listen uh, and, and I'm stay a little tuned. worried about that word seminal, but you know, we know how I mean it. <laughs> Just keep the camel's nose <laughs> out of your come on, come on, and you'll be good. We there are other topics too. We'll get to all of that in just a bit, including. A very funny, I think, picture of the week. But first, 
A word from our sponsor for this segment of Security Now. Lookout. Oh, man, I know Lookout. Lookout, you need Lookout. Your data is always on the move, whether it's on a device, uh, in the cloud, across networks, or at the local coffee shop. Now, your workforce loves this flexibility, but it is a challenge for IT security. Lookout helps you control your data and free your workforce. With Lookout, you gain complete visibility into all your data so you can minimize risk from external and internal threats and ensure compliance. That's very important these days. By seamlessly securing hybrid work, your organization doesn't have to sacrifice productivity, employee happiness for security. Your IT department's already under stress and strain, right? They have to work with multiple point solutions. They've got legacy tools. They're moving from tab to tab and app to app, trying to get the job done. It's not easy. It's too complex. And as you know, when you move around from context to context, information falls through the cracks. And that means insecurity. And that's why you need Lookout. With its single unified platform, Lookout reduces IT complexity and, it, and means you can focus on whatever else is coming your way. And believe me, there's stuff coming your way. That's why you're listening to the show, right? Good data protection. It's not a cage. It's a springboard, letting you and your organization bound toward a future of your making. Visit Lookout.com today. Learn how to safeguard data and secure hybrid work and reduce IT complexity. All with one program. Lookout.com. We thank him so much for supporting security now. All right, Steve, I'm ready. For the so, picture of the week. Okay, so I've had this one in my bag of tricks for a, a month or two, and just sort of waiting for the right time. And I just, I just love this. So, for those who can't, who aren't seeing the the picture in in live feed, uh, the, the, I don't know. We, we can only see like where this object is that is the focus of the picture, not the setting, the larger setting which it's meant to be describing. But we have this this large square, it, it probably metal embossed sign where in big, huge, all caps, <laughs> in, in, in in relief, it says, "Please do not touch." <laughs> so it's referring to something, you know, in its environment that we are being told, "Whoa, do not touch." Well, the the punchline here, however. Is, is that 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 admonition is repeated in Braille at, <laughs> below, below the sign? That's something you Which, don't expect and, to see in Braille. Is please do not touch. Yeah. You're touching so it. And, yeah. and I'm wondering what happens if if a if a non sighted person you know reaches out and scans us with their fingers. Do they then jump back? They leap because, back. Oh my God! <laughs> oh, I'm you know, touching it. I'm, I'm not supposed to touch this. Anyway, I I gave this this picture the caption. Please provide a clear visual example of irony. <laughs> I love it. And uh, very yes. nice. Please very do nice. not touch in Braille. Yeah. Okay. So, um, what would an IoT device look like that had been taken over? That's something we've never talked about. Hmm. You know, we, we've talked a lot about the threat that's posed by the remote takeover of IoT devices. We, we know without any question that there are a great many very large bot fleets and that they're composed of, of individual, unattended, internet-connected devices. Well, one of our listeners, Joe Lyon, sent me an image of a Twitter posting where the poster is rhetorically asking why his LG washing machine is using 3.6 gigabytes of data per day. Wow. <laughs> yeah, 3.6 gig. And he attached an image to his, his Twitter posting that was produced by some network monitoring tool showing that something on his network whose interface is labeled LG Smart Laundry Open <laughs> is indeed quite busy on the network. A little too smart. <laughs> yeah, exactly. A little too smart for its own Just good. Just wash the damn clothes. And, I don't need and, to surf in the net while you're doing it. <laughs> and, you know, whatever's going on is, <laughs> is happening very uniformly for a full 24 hours. Because this chart that we've got on, on, on the show notes shows 24 hours of use with only one hour 
of the 24 showing a reduced total wow. bandwidth during that hour. So, yeah, there's, you know, certainly something sufficient there to raise suspicion. Now, what also caught my eye was that the labels on the traffic flow show a download of 75 and a quarter or three quarters megabytes and like for the day and a whopping upload oh. of 3.57 gigabytes. That's not good. Now, anyone who's worked with networking gear knows that it's very important to know which directions up and down are referring to. Cisco has always used, I was very pleased with them about this, the unambiguous terms in and out, as in traffic flowing into or out of a network interface. So if the interface is facing toward the internet, then traffic flowing out of it would be up toward the internet and traffic flowing into it would be down from the internet. But if the interface is facing inward toward, for example, connected to a local area network, then the meaning of in and out would be reversed. Okay, so without a bit more information about the network's configuration shown in this picture, we can't be 100% certain. But either the washing machine's networking system is badly broken, at, causing it to continuously download at a rate of three and a half gig of something per day, or as does seem more likely given the evidence, the label upload, even though we cannot be certain what that means, you know, uh, suggests that this washing machine has probably become a bot in someone's army. So it's busy doing its part uploading 3.6 gigabytes of junk on a continuous basis, presumably nonsense traffic, just causing some remote person grief. That makes now see. I saw this story and I thought, well, what could it? Is it keeping track of what you what clothes you're washing? <laughs> no, no, it's been compromised. Yes, yeah, yes. that makes that a would, lot more sense. That would be the con that would be the conclusion. This is what an IoT device looks like when it's been compromised. So this brings me to two final observations. First, since the typical consumer is not monitoring their local network's traffic in any way. They would have no way of knowing that this was going on at all, ever. And given the closed turnkey nature of an LG washing machine, it's unclear how one would go about reflashing its firmware to remove the bot, even if you knew that one was in there. You know, it might be just living in RAM, in which case pulling the plug, counting to 10, and powering it back up might be all that's needed to, to, to flush it out of the system. But then the device might become re-inhabited again before long, as we know happens. So the only real solution would be to take the washing machine off the net, which brings me to my second point. What the heck is a washing machine doing, doing being connected internet. to the internet in the first place? Exactly. You know, <laughs> Is this another of those just because we can doesn't mean we should situations? You know, I've owned washing machines my entire adult life. After mom stopped, started, stopped, you know, washing my underwear for me, I took that over. The only thing any of them have ever been connected to is AC power. Uh, you know, so is it really necessary for us to initiate a rinse cycle while we're out <laughs> roaming around? somewhere or to be notified with a message delivered through an app when our clothes are dry but you that know? is the purpose of that i know i've seen him sell it that way like oh. you can control your washing machine from anywhere oh that's great yeah. so you know i get it you know that if all of that amazing functionality is free and included and you know these days it nothing costs anything anymore then why not set it up and get it on the internet but we're talking about this because of maybe why not to do that. Maybe 
something has crawled into that machine and not just because you needed to wash your clothes more often and set up housekeeping there. Maybe the only thing it's currently doing is flooding hapless remote victims with unwanted internet traffic. And maybe also, if it wanted to, it could pivot and start poking around inside your residential network. Oh, yeah. And just maybe that could end up being a high price to pay for the luxury of being notified by an app when the lint filter needs to be changed. So... If these sorts of things are going on, you know, uh, like if these sorts of things, these appliances are going to be connected to your network, again, give some thought to sequestering them on a separate guest LAN, which has no access to your high value LAN. Most of today's consumer routers now offer this feature. That makes it easier to implement than it was back when we first started talking about the idea of LAN separation many years back. You know, remember my, my three dumb routers, you know, concept for how, how to create isolated LANs uh, when, when that feature was not already built into our routers. Well, the or good better news is, yet, just don't connect it at all, right? Just, exactly. Ask yeah. yourself, do I really need... And, and, and here's the problem. That, like... The, this was thrown in to a washing machine by people who are more concerned about whether it actually gets your clothes clean than it being on the Internet. So the Internet is a throwaway for them. They're not going to be that concerned about the security of their own washing machine that they're shipping. This is not Cisco who is selling you a washing machine. You know, this is LG. And, so. and probably they have a module they put in all their appliances, right? This is just, you know, the right. LG Internet of Things module. Right. And, and it's we'll using figure code out sell it. from the dawn of the Internet because, yeah. you know, it worked and right. they don't care. So, you know, the, the end user needs to care. Wow. Okay. And speaking of DDoS attacks, this related bit of news was also pointed to by a listener, uh, Tsukima. Uh, who's at twit.social. Uh, he wrote, I use this service for all of my personal projects and liked it so much I was motivated to support them financially. And yet they are having a massive DDoS attack and thought it worth talking about publicly, especially as examples of tech doing everything right while still being vulnerable. And he and, and, and in his tweet to me, he sent the URL outage.sr.ht. So I went over and took a look and I wanted to share what I found because it's just such a perfect example. And then we'll talk a little bit more about mitigation strategies. One of the three guys who runs the service, actually uh, its founder uh, over at source hut, which is the name of, of the service. He wrote, my name is drew. I'm the founder of source hut and one of three Source Hut staff members working on the outage, alongside my colleagues Simon and Conrad. As you've noticed, Source Hut is down. I offer my deepest apologies for this situation. We've made a name for ourselves for reliability, and this is the most severe and prolonged outage we've ever faced. We spend a lot of time planning to make sure this does not happen, and we failed. We have all hands on deck working the problem to restore service as soon as possible. In our emergency planning models, we have procedures in place for many kinds of eventualities. What has happened this week is essentially our worst case scenario. What if the primary data center just disappeared tomorrow? We ask this question of ourselves seriously and make serious plans for what we do if this were to pass. And we're executing those plans now, though we had hoped that we would never need to. I humbly ask for your patience and support as we deal with a very difficult situation. And again, I offer my deepest apologies that this situation has come to pass. So what happened? At 6.30 UTC on January 10th, Two days prior to the time of writing, a distributed denial of service attack, DDoS, began targeting SourceHut. 
We still do not know many details. We don't know who they are or why they're targeting us, but we do know that they are targeting Source Hut specifically. We deal with ordinary DDoS attacks in the, okay, so just that. His, his, his phrase, we deal with ordinary DDoS attacks in the normal course of operations. It's like, okay, it's a sad state of affairs that, that, that you, you refer to ordinary DDoS attacks. And he says, and we are generally able to mitigate them on our end. However, this is not an ordinary DDoS attack. The attacker possesses considerable resources and is operating at a scale beyond which we have the means to mitigate ourselves. In response, before we could do much ourselves to understand or mitigate the problem, our upstream network provider null routed Source Hut entirely, rendering both the internet at large and Source Hut staff unable to reach our own servers. The primary data center, PHL, was affected by this problem. We rent co-location space from our PHL supplier, where we have our own servers installed. We purchase networking through our provider, who allocates us a block out of their AS. You know, we talked about AS numbers, right? Autonomous system numbers. And who upstreams with Cogent, which is... Which is the upstream that ultimately black holed us. Unfortunately, our co-location provider went through two acquisitions in the past year, and we failed to notice that our account had been forgotten as they migrated between ticketing systems through one of these acquisitions. Thus, we were unable to page them. We were initially forced to wait until their normal office hours began to contact them seven hours after the start of the incident. When we did finally get them on the phone, our access to support ticketing was restored. They apologized profusely for the mistake, and we were able to work with them on restoring service and addressing the problems we were facing. This led to Source Hut's availability being partially restored on the evening of January 10th until the DDoS escalated in the early hours of January 11th, after which point, our provider was forced to null route us again. We have seen some collateral damage as well. You may have noticed that Hacker News was down on January 10th. We believe that was ultimately due to Cogent's heavy-handed approach to mitigating the DDoS targeting source hut. Sorry, Hacker News, that you, that, uh, that, that you, or see, so he says, sorry. And then he said, Hacker News, glad you got it sorted. Then he said, last night, a nonprofit free software forge known as Codeberg also became subject to a DDoS, which is still ongoing and may have caused, been, been caused by the same actors. This caused our status page to go offline. Codeberg has been kind enough to host it for us so that it's reachable during the outage. We're not sure if Codeberg was targeted because they hosted our status page or if this is part of a broader attack on free software forge platforms. Okay, so we're ju we were just talking about, of course, the LG smart washing machine and the idea that it was apparently sending a continuous stream of traffic totaling about three and a half gigabytes per day out onto the internet for some purpose. So I wanted to put a face on this to make it a bit more real for everyone. Um, what I've just shared is a perfect example of where such traffic goes, like that this washing machine was apparently admitting onto the internet, and it's very real consequences for people. You know, people are having their lives seriously affected by these sorts of, attack, these sorts of attacks. Now, Drew used the term null routing, which is the action taken by major carriers, such as Cogent in this case, when some client or client's client or client's client's client, because, you know, Cogent is a tier one provider, is undergoing a sustained attack. They essentially pull the plug, you know, they have no interest in carrying 
traffic that is, that is indirectly and inadvertently attacking their network. When an attack originates, as most do now, from a globally dispersed and distributed collection of anonymous and autonomous bots, that traffic, which is all aimed at a single common IP address somewhere, will enter the network of a major carrier like Cogent all across the globe as well. So that means that the attack is crossing into Cogent's routers from all of its many various peering partners who are the ones whose networks have been, have been infected with some bots. Or perhaps the traffic is just transiting across their network and, originate, and, and originates from some other major carrier's network. Whatever the case, the real danger of these attacks is its concentration. As the traffic hops from one router to the next, with each hop bringing it closer to its destination, that traffic is being aggregated. It is growing in strength, and it can get to the point of debilitating the routers it's attempting to pass through. This means that the optimal action for any major carrier like Cogent to take is to prevent this traffic aggregation by blocking the attacking traffic immediately at all and each of the many points of, of ingress and entry into their network from their peering partners. So Cogent sends routing table updates out to every one of the peering routers on their border, instructing that router to null route, meaning immediately discard any packets attempting to enter their network which are bound for the IP that's under attack. This neuters the attack without causing any harm to their network because it's unable to concentrate. And since there will almost certainly be malicious bots running inside the networks of some of Cogent's client ISPs, this null routing must also be applied internally as well as on their border. Okay, but notice that now with the targeted IP null routed, it's also impossible for any benign traffic to reach its destination service. As Drew wrote, they were unable to even reach their own servers, you know, even if they had some back way into them because of this null route. No traffic was getting to their servers, good or bad. A major carrier's null routing inherently not only blocks the attacking traffic, but any and all traffic to that service, no matter what. In fact, once the attack has subsided and full service could be restored, that site will remain dark until someone at the service provider notices that the attack has mitigated and then lifts the network-wide block to allow regular services to resume. DDoS attacks like this one have become a fact of life on the internet. Anyone who's working for any major service provider sees them and deals with them now as part of their daily routine. But as we've just seen, this doesn't make such attacks any less significant and potentially devastating to anyone who's committed to keeping whatever services they offer available. And we also know where these attacks originate. They originate from devices exactly like that LG smart washing machine, a gadget that largely operates autonomously where networking is not its primary focus. It was tacked on, as we said earlier, as a feature. So it never got the attention that it needed to be a truly secure networking device. And we also know that the phrase, unfortunately, truly secure networking device almost needs to be said with tongue in cheek because sadly it's become an oxymoron. You know, truly secure networking device. Well, it's almost become the holy grail. Everything we've learned is that it is truly difficult to create and maintain a truly 
secure networking device. And the more features are added, the more quickly the challenge grows. And Leo, I think at this point, uh, since I don't want to interrupt our, our major topic, which we'll be explaining, I think that now would be a right. good time to tell our listeners about another sponsor. And then we're going to talk about the major problem that was discovered in quantum crypto. What? In quantum crypto? <laughs> oh, Man. not good. Not You're good. nothing but bad news today, I tell you. All right. Let me tell you about Bitwarden in that case, because this is good news. Bit, by the way, we were talking on Windows Weekly last week, and and Paul Thoreau was all upset because he didn't like to have to keep entering his his password into the password manager, into Bitwarden. So what did Bitwarden do this week? They made it possible for you to be use pass keys to log into Bitwarden. Nice. It's awesome. Nice. This is why you want Bitwarden. It's open source. People can submit pull requests. One of our listeners, Quexen, actually made it possible for Bitwarden to add a memory hard public key derivation function uh, to replace PBKDF2. They put in uh, Argon2. In fact, I'm using it. Thanks to Quexen. He submitted it. Open source. They applied it. They checked it. They tested it. You can test it. I can go on and on. The other thing that's great about being open source as a password manager is that it's free. It's free forever. If you want to use the personal version of Bitwarden, it's free for an unlimited number of passwords on any device you want. Windows, Mac, Linux, iOS, Android. It works everywhere. You can even use your authentication device. They used to ask for a, a premium donation if you wanted to use a YubiKey. Not anymore. I really love this company. They make it easier and easier for people to use a password manager. And as you know, because you listen to this show, it's becoming more and more important all the time that you use a password manager. Generating and managing complex passwords should be easy. It should be something people, even non-sophisticated, non-technical people can do easily. And with Bitwarden, they can. And they can no longer say to you, oh, I don't want to pay for a password manager because the personal edition of Bitwarden is free forever. You can access your passwords, your pass keys, even sensitive information. And every bit of your information, including the sites you visit, the sites you have passwords for, is encrypted with Bitwarden across multiple devices and platforms for free, keeping you secure at work, at home, and on the go. And by the way, we're moving to Bitwarden Enterprise. If you want to have Bitwarden at work, you can too. They've got a Teams plan, an Enterprise plan. They have family plans. I actually subscribe to the premium plan because I want to support them. Just, I don't need the features that they've, every feature I want is in there in the free plan, but I want to support them. Get started with Bitwarden, their free trial of Teams or Enterprise, or you can get started for free across all devices as an individual user. This is a password manager done right. And now with Bitwarden, you can go completely passwordless. You don't even need to remember a master password anymore. What, what, what they're doing, and I think it's really important, and, and I really honor them for doing it, is they know it's got to be easy or people aren't going to use it. So they make it as easy as possible. Tell your friends, tell your family, bitwarden.com slash twit. Tell your work, maybe it's time we move to Bitwarden. Bitwarden.com slash twit. Twit. This is the password manager, the only one I use and recommend, the one Steve decided to go to when he left LastPass. Yep. We're just big fans. Bitwarden.com slash twit. All right. This is really a good episode. You've got so much juice in this. But wait a minute. Quantum crypto problems? That's... Okay, so, wait a minute now. Yeah. Okay. So Bleeping Computer recently reported the news that many implementations of the already in widespread use post-quantum key encapsulation mechanism known as Kyber, which, as I said, is in use, for example, by the Mulvad VPN and to provide signals post-quantum redundancy. We talked about that before. They jumped right on it and we said, yay, great, but whoops. So it's been found to be subject to timing attacks. The set of attacks have been dubbed Kyber Slash. Okay, now, the first thing to understand here is that nothing has been found wanting from the post-quantum 
Kyber algorithm itself. As far as everyone knows, Kyber still provides very good quantum resistance. The problem and vulnerability is limited to some of the actual code that was used to implement the Kyber algorithm. And this is part of the typical shaking out process that new algorithms undergo. First, we need to get the theory right. Then it's tested to prove that it does what we thought. Next, the code is implemented into libraries where it can actually be used and tested in the real world. And it was at this point in the process that these troubles arose. The problem is that the vulnerable algorithms perform an integer division instruction where the numbers being divided are dependent upon the algorithm's secret key. Huh, whoops. Since division is an instruction whose timing can vary widely based on the binary bit pattern of the specific numbers being divided, this naturally results in a situation where the secret that needs to be kept has the potential to leak out through a timing side channel. And that's exactly what happened here. Now, it's, it's such an obvious and well understood problem that it's kind of shocking that this could happen. And really, whoever wrote that code should be scolded a bit. You know, perhaps they were just having a bad day, or perhaps they're solely focused on theory and not enough on practice. So who knows? But in any event, the problem was found, and it's well understood. And many of the libraries that implemented the vulnerable reference code have now been updated and, and more are being updated. So it's a good thing that we're doing this now rather than two years from now or 10 years from now or whenever it might be that we actually become dependent upon the strength of these post-quantum algorithms to protect against quantum-based attacks. We're, we're okay, you know, and to their credit, Signal, remember, added this to their existing crypto rather than switching over to this, recognizing that its unproven nature meant that it really couldn't be trusted fully yet. So Signal was never in danger, and now they're less so. Okay, and Leo, we got a cool picture here, um, and, and this is apropos of, of the, the podcast's main topic. Stat Counter produced this somewhat bracing screenshot of global web browser use 12 years ago, back in 2012, wow. and two years ago in 2022. So since today's podcast is all about <laughs> Google and their Chrome browser, you know, yikes. So for oh, those... This is not good. <laughs> <laughs> So what I want to know is what's going on in Iceland. I think yeah. that's Iceland. <laughs> it's you know? gray. What is uh, gray? Yeah, well, that's Safari. Oh, but wow. so okay. So so for, for our listeners who can't see because they're listening, thus listener. Anyway, uh, the first picture from 2012 shows you know what the world looked like. What uh, what uh, 12 years ago. Um, all of the U.S. and Canada and Alaska and Iceland and sort of the the northwest of Africa looks like all of Australia. Anyway, all of that is a light, like a blue, and that was IE. Everybody yeah. 14 years ago was using Internet Explorer. Interestingly, Mo Mozilla's Firefox was scattered around. Yeah, look at France. In uh, Europe, yeah, yeah. exactly. Europe and and uh, uh, Italy. Asia. And, and, yeah. 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 So there was a lot of Firefox use. And, of course, Chrome was there. Uh, it looks like Africa, the whole continent, most of it, except for a little bit of IE, what, what, what was Chrome. Russia was all Chrome. Um uh, and there was also some some scatter bits of opera. Anyway, so that was then. Whoa! Should you be the take title a look at the show: scattered it, bits of opera, <laughs> <laughs> little bits of opera. Yeah. Uh, okay. Now, I, Holy okay. Cow. This is on depressing. the on, on the key of this second updated chart from two years ago. There is blue 
for Microsoft Edge? I don't know where it is on the map. I don't Literally see any. On the map. Yeah. I don't see any blue. All I see is Chrome. Except Chrome for Iceland. has taken over. <laughs> just, is that I Iceland mean, or Greenland? What is? <laughs> oh, good, good question. Anyway. Um, oh, there's if, the blue. If, we found the blue. It's Chad. I don't know where that is. This could little... also be a map of COVID, unfortunately. Yeah, unfortunately. It's you all know, green. The, the, you know, so so Chrome is the COVID of browsers. Uh, it's just, it's everywhere. Okay, so with that in mind, we'll be talking about what Google has done to browsers, which is to say all browsers, because they're pretty much one and the same. I'm gonna. I'm gonna. I have a couple little bits of of uh, feedback from our listeners. I want to talk about, and then we're gonna plunge in. So, of course, there were predictably many replies from our listeners about my follow up discussion last week of the Apple backdoor. I, I just grabbed one to finish out this subject. David Wise wrote, "Hey Steve, listening to your podcast about the Apple vulnerability, could this be a supply chain hack with the phones being built in China?" My answer, sure, absolutely. Unfortunately, literally anything is possible. I think it's safe to say that by the nature of this, we'll never have a satisfactory answer to the many questions surrounding exactly how or why this all happened. All we know for sure is that backdoor hardware exists in the hardware that Apple sold and shipped. And notice by David's question that plausible deniability exists here. All of the several possible sources of this can claim absolute surprise and total ignorance of how this came to pass. Is it significant that it first appeared in 2018, three years after the famous high visibility 2015 San Bernardino terrorist attack, several years being the approximate lead time for a new silicon design to move all the way through verification, fabrication, and into physical devices. Again, we'll never know. And yeah, that's annoying. Um, Osink sort tweeted, Hi, Steve. I'm a fan of the podcast and all the great work you've done in your career, especially a fan of Squirrel. Thank you for this great work, and I wish it to be mainstream in the near future. Well, so do I, but don't hold your breath. I recently listened to episode 885. As you, 885, okay, a while ago, and you briefly touch on a subject that I've been contemplating, getting into InfoSec. I'm currently thinking about getting into InfoSec as a career. I'm in my 40s and wanted to know from your perspective if 40s is too old to get into the field. My career is online marketing, and I've been fortunate to have been doing it from the early days of Web 1.0 to what is now referred to as Web 3.0. However, after COVID, I have not had the same opportunities in the marketing world. So I find myself looking for a new career and thinking InfoSec may be the solution. Any advice slash opinion is welcomed. Thanks in advance. Okay, so the good news is that there is a huge and unmet and even growing demand for information security professionals today. I think that the trouble with any sort of, you know, am I too old question is that so much of the answer to that depends upon the individual. A particular person in their early 30s might already be too old, whereas someone else who's in, you know, who's 55 might not be. But speaking only very generally, since that's all I can do here, I think I'd say that someone in their 40s probably spans the range where the question of too old might start to be an issue if it's a concern for them. Early 40s, not so much. Late 40s, well, maybe a bit more so. But regardless, there's definitely something, a lot actually, to be said for having some gravitas and life experience that only comes with age. 
an IT guy who's more world-wise will generally be much more useful than a fresh newbie who is still addressing the world with impractical expectations. And especially for an IT guy, knowing how to talk to others is a skill that should not be undervalued. So I think that on balance, I'd say go for it and know that the demand for that skill set will only be increasing over time. This is where I would put in the plug for ACI Learning, our sponsor, or IT <laughs> Pro TV. And, you know, you could certainly learn. I don't think it's ever too late to learn the skills. Right. So really the only question you're, you're asking is, can I get hired? Um, and, you know, that that's just going to depend if you've got the, the, the skill set, if you've got well, the certs, I think and so. And, Leo, if this guy has been listening to this podcast. Yeah, for, that's a good like, way to start. From the beginning. <laughs> yeah. We keep hearing from people. It's like, yeah, I just went in. I didn't it's even study training. and I passed the yeah, test. It's like, yeah. okay, that's great. Yeah, that's a good point. So uh, someone whose handle is 3N0M41Y which gave me some pause until I realized it was uh, supposed to be anomaly. <laughs> he said, <laughs> hi, Steve. I would like to get your opinion on Proton Drive versus Sync as a, cl as a secure cloud storage network. Recently, the iOS Sync app has broken the ability to natively use the built-in iOS file app to navigate Sync's folder structure properly. What happens is that after drilling down one to two directories, the Sync app pushes the structure back to the root folder. While this is not a showstopper, it does break the use of other third-party apps on iOS. I've reached out to, to the Sync dev team, but they've responded that it will take, quote, quite a, file, quite a while, unquote, to fix. This functionality broke about two months ago. So I just want to get your take if Proton has matured enough to be a replacement for Sync. Cheers and Happy New Year. Okay, so first of all, let me just note that I'm very disappointed when something I've deeply researched and then strongly endorse, anyone remember LastPass? Later, evolves or devolves in such a way that I come to regret my previous full-throated endorsement. So I'm disappointed to learn that Sync is not standing behind and repairing their various client apps in a timely way. As for Proton Drive, I have not looked deeply enough to form any opinion one way or the other. However, its Proton name should be familiar since these are the same Swiss people who offer the very popular Proton Mail service. So my strong inclination would be to trust them. What I have no idea about is how their feature-rich offering might, you know, match up against sync. But my shooting from the hip thought would be that if it does what you want for a price that makes sense, I'd say that based upon their past performance on everything else we know they've done, I'd be inclined to give them the benefit of any doubt. That's obviously not definitive, but at least it's something. Okay, so, and last, a note about Spinrite. It has been so extremely useful these past final months of work on Spinrite to have this podcast's listeners taking the current Spinrite release candidate out for a spin and providing feedback about their experiences. That feedback has been the primary driving force behind the last few improvements to Spinrite 6.1, which turned out to be quite significant. So I'm glad that I did not declare it finished before that. And it's been a slowly growing chorus of feedback about something else that caused me to decide that I needed to change one last thing. Sort of <laughs> echoing Steve Jobs. If you've been following along, you'll recall that one of the astonishing things we discovered during Spinrite's development was that all of the original and past versions of the PC industry's most popular BIOS produced by American Megatrends and commonly known as the AMI BIOS contained a very serious bug in its USB handling code. 
any access to any USB connected drive past the drive's 137 gigabyte point, which is where 28 bits of binary sector addressing overflow into the 29th bit, causes these AMI BIOSes, which are in the majority, to overwrite the system's main memory right where applications typically load. When, the, when this came to light, I was so appalled by that discovery and by the idea that this could be very damaging not only to Spinrite's code in RAM, but potentially to its users' data, that I decided to flatly prohibit Spinrite 6.1 from accessing any USB-connected drive past its 137 gig point. The next Spinrite won't suffer from any of this trouble since it won't, you know, it'll have its own direct high performance native USB drivers. So my plan was just to get going on Spinrite 7 as quickly as possible. But Spinrite's early users who have attached larger than 137 gigabyte drives via USB and then had 6.1 tell them that they could only safely test the first 137 gigabytes of their drive, have not been happy. And also since then, one of the guys who hangs out in GRC's news groups, Paul Farrer, who I've referred to before when this bug was happening, he was curious to learn more about this. So he looked into the problem while I continued to work on other aspects of Spinrite, working toward just getting it done. Paul wrote a set of exploratory DOS utilities and tested them with a bunch of old motherboards owned by some of our Spinrite testers in the news groups. What he discovered suggested that more could be done than just turning my back on all USB BIOS access in disgust. And the disappointment I was seeing from new people being exposed to Spinrite's refusal to work with any USB BIOS convinced me that I needed to fix this. So I started on that last week, and I expect to have it finished this week because it's not a big deal. Since only the AMI BIOS is known to have this problem, Spinrite will start by lifting this blanket ban from all non-AMI BIOSes. Then for AMI BIOSes, since they don't all have this trouble, I've reverse engineered the code surrounding the bug, and I now fully understand what's going on. So Spinrite can now detect when the bug is actually present and can patch the buggy BIOS code in place to raise Spinrite's access limit from 130 gigabytes to 2.2 terabytes. The buggy AMI USB BIOS code will still have a bug that prevents Spinrite from working past 2.2 terabytes, but that's way, much, way better in today's world than clamping all USB BIOS access for everyone at 137 gig. So that's the Spinrite that everyone will get, and maybe next week. So again, a, a nice feature benefit the and I again I'm glad that I waited and am putting this in next week really next week uh, like like <laughs> yeah maybe close I mean Make like no there's, promises there's, there's, please there's really nothing left uh it, I'm really happy with it nobody has nice. found any problems at all for the last couple months now and, you know, wow. while I've been, like, letting it sit and stew and cook. So, yeah. That's awesome. We're, we're, we're right there. Well, I'll, I, we'll have a cake ready for you. We'll have a party. I'll have <laughs> Just don't fireworks. throw it in my face. Yeah. Well, no, I won't. <laughs> we, might, we, might have some, uh, we might have some confetti that we can uh, throw in the air instead. How about that? A little I'm, party yeah. for you, Steve. That <laughs> would be very nice. <laughs> All right. We're going to get to the heart of the subject. I can't oh, wait. Boy. Oh, boy. Uh, what is Google doing uh, to protect your privacy and to help advertisers, we'll find out. This is uh, this is kind of breaking news, I think. So uh, I'm looking forward to hearing this. But before we do that, let me tell you about our sponsor, one that we have used and had to use, and this has to do with security. You know, if you've ever searched for your name online, uh, you probably noticed there's a lot of PII, personally identifiable information about you out there. 
your income, your house, your how much you paid for your house, your car, photos, et cetera, et cetera. Now, you might say, well, that's a privacy violation, but it's also a security issue. And it was for us at TWIT. Uh, it really came to the head when people started impersonating our CEO, Lisa, sending urgent text messages to employees saying, I'm in a meeting. Can you quickly get some Amazon gift cards for me and send them to me? Uh, I'll pay you back or, you know, something, use your TWIT credit card. And, it, you know, of course it was a scam. And fortunately, our employees are well-trained. But here's the thing. Whoever did it knew that Lisa was the CEO. She knew who her direct reports were. They knew the email and phone numbers of those people. That stuff's online. And that's why it's a major security issue for any company. Uh, this, is, this is enabling spear phishing, basically. So we went to Delete Me. Lisa actually signed up for Delete Me and got her PII removed. Delete Me helps reduce risk from identity theft, from credit card fraud, from robocalls, cybersecurity threats, harassment, just in general, unwanted communications. So here's how it works. She signed up. You're going to have to give them some basic information because they need to know what they're looking for, right? Uh, so you give them that basic personal information. Don't worry. They keep it safe. Delete Me's experts will find and remove your personally identifiable information from hundreds of data brokers. Now, that reduces your online footprint, helps keep you safe. But then, then this is really important. They will scan and remove your personal information regularly. We're talking addresses, photos, emails, relatives, phone numbers, social media, property value, and on and on and on. And the reason it's important is because these data brokers are so scummy that even if you do the takedown and, and you fill out the form, you say, take my information down, they will. But that doesn't stop them from repopulating it as they get more information from others. That's why Delete Me continually goes back and says, is it still down? Now, you will want to take advantage of their privacy advisors because everybody's threat model is different. Uh, privacy advisors are there at Delete Me to make sure you get the support you need and, and understand what's going on. Really, is this is this it really worked for us, and I highly recommend it. Protect yourself. Reclaim your privacy. Join DeleteMe.com slash twit. Join deleteme.com slash twit. The offer code twit will get you 20% off. And of course, let them know you heard it here, which is important to us. So go there, join deleteme.com slash twit. Use the offer code twit, save 20%. This service not only works, uh, I think it's more important than you might imagine. You know, for your company's point of view, it, it, even if it's not from your personal point of view. Join deleteme.com slash twit. We thank them so much. Uh, for the work they've done for us and the support they're giving us on uh, security now. All right, Steve. Okay. I'm ready. Let's find out what's going on. What's Google up to now? This is big. Um, I mentioned last week that I thought I might be on to an interesting topic to explore this week. It turned out that while the guy I stumbled upon was the real deal, his several blog postings were sharing pieces from his Master of Law dissertation for the University of Edinburgh. After I looked into it more deeply, it didn't really make for the sort of content I know our listeners are looking for. This scholar was carefully examining the legal and policy implications of Google's recent work on the web, the set of new technologies collectively known as the Privacy Sandbox. And he was looking at it against EU and UK laws like the GDPR. What would it mean in that context? And this guy was not some lawyer. He is a deep technology guy who has been actively involved with the W3C, serving on many committees and having co-authored a number of web specs. His focus has always been on privacy. And he's the guy who, years ago, realized that the addition of a high-resolution battery level meter into the HTML5 specifications would provide another signal that could be used for fingerprinting and tracking people across the web. But as I said, his focus was on what Google's recent work would mean legally. And for what it's worth, his very well-informed legal and technical academic this guy, who is also a privacy nut, is quite bullish on the future Google has been paving for us. So that just means that what we are going to talk about this week is all the more relevant and significant. 
And what we are going to talk about this week is something known as the Protected Audience API. It's another of the several components which make up what Google collectively refers to as their privacy sandbox. Now, the name Protected Audience API is every bit as awkward as many of Google's other names. You know, they're a big company. They could afford to employ someone with the title of director of naming things and give this person a big office and a staff because it's clear and it will soon become much clearer that the nerds who invent this technology should not not be the ones to name it. In this instance, what's protected is user privacy and audience refers to the audience for web-based display advertising. But as it is, calling this the protected audience API only tells you what it is after you already know, which is not the definition of a great name. In any event, this collection of work that Google has called their privacy sandbox currently contains a handful, dare I say a plethora, of different APIs. There's the, <laughs> <laughs> there's the new Topics API, which we've previously covered at length. And there's the Protected Audience API, which is what we'll be looking at today. But then there's also something known as the Private State Tokens API, the Attribution Reporting API, the Related Website Sets API, the Shared Storage API, the Chips API, the Fenced Frames API, and the Federated Credential Management API. And if you didn't already know what those things are, knowing their names only helps with, you know, very broad strokes. But here's what everyone listening really does need to know. All of this brand new, serious, deliberately user privacy focused technology, which Google's engineers have recently created and somewhat unfortunately named is real. It collectively represents a truly major step forward in web technology. We all grew up in and cut our teeth on extremely simple web technology that its founders would still clearly recognize today. You know, even after many years, this baby hadn't grown much and it was still far from mature. We had cookies and JavaScript and ambition and a lot of ideas about what we wanted to do with the web. But everyone was heading in their own direction, doing whatever they needed for themselves just to get the job done. And no one was thinking or worrying about longer term consequences. The web lacked the architectural and technological depth to get us to go in the way we needed to get there. So we wound up with the absolute chaos of tracking and identity brokering and personal data warehousing, de-anonymizing, and all the rest of the mess that defines today's World Wide Web. And an example of the mess we're in today is the utter pointless bureaucracy, you know, the bureaucratic insanity of the GDPR forcing all websites to get cookie usage permission from each of their visitors. We know that Google is fueled by the revenue generated from advertising. Advertisers want to know everything they possibly can about their audience. They want to optimize their ad buys and users are creeped out by the knowledge that they're being tracked around the internet and profiled and being the super heavyweight that it is. Google is increasingly coming under scrutiny, you know, under the microscope, but they also have the technological savvy, probably unlike most other players on earth, at this time in our history to actually solve this very thorny problem, which arises from the collision of apparently diametrically opposed interests on today's web. One thing is clear. We're in desperate need of more technology than cookies. 
Google began the work to truly solve these problems in earnest three years ago at the start of 2021. And this wasn't some half-baked attempt to gloss over the true problems that are inherent in the use of a system that was never designed or intended to be used as it is being used today. Google's Privacy Sandbox Initiative was, and today is, a significant step forward in web browser technology and standards, which is designed to allow the web to finance its own ongoing existence and services through advertising without in any significant way compromising the privacy of its users. Okay, now we've all, I get it, we've all been so badly abused by the way things have been that it may be difficult to accept that there truly is a way for this to be accomplished. But there is. And Google has done it. In the future, the use of the web will be much more private than it ever has been since it was first conceived. What's required to make this possible is a is way more technology that has ever been deployed before. What's been done before now, you know, couldn't even be called a half measure. All of the various APIs I mentioned above, you know, whatever it is they each do, became available in the middle of last year at the start of the third quarter of 2023. They are all operable today, right now have been for the last six months, and they are in the world's dominant web browser and other browsers that share its Chromium engine. And it's not as if there wasn't something, uh, you know, well, some wrong turns that were made along the way, right? You know, but that's also the nature of pioneering where the path hasn't already been mapped out. Flock, remember, Google's federated learning of cohorts was an attempt at generating an opaque token that revealed nothing about the user's browser other than a collection of their interests. But Flock didn't get off the ground. It failed. It, it fell was later replaced. Yes. yes. <laughs> it, it later it was later replaced by Topics, which is a complex but extremely clever system for doing essentially the same thing, but in a far less opaque and thus far more understandable fashion. Topics allows the user's browser to learn about the user by observing where they go on the on the web. All of which information is retained by and never leaves the browser. Then through the use of the protected audience API, which I'll get to the user's browser is able to later intelligently select the ads that its own user will see. I know. If that comes as something of a surprise, it should, since it's certainly not the way any of this has ever worked before. Okay, we got a lot to cover. It's good stuff. One of the key features to note and to keep in mind is that this expands the role of the web browser significantly. There is now far more going on under the covers than ever before. It was once fun and easy to explain how a web browser cookie worked. It wasn't difficult to explain because there wasn't much to it. But there is very little that's easy to explain about how these various next generation privacy sandbox browser APIs function. And this is made even more difficult by the fact that they're all so deeply interconnected. When we originally discussed topics, we had no sense that its purpose was to allow the user's browser to autonomously perform ad selection. But that was always Google's intention. We just needed to see more of the whole picture. And even when we were only seeing a small portion of the whole, explaining the operation of topics required a very careful description because it is laced with important subtleties. And I, so, and I suppose that's the main point I want to convey here because we're now asking so much from the operation of the web, 
even wanting things that appear to be in direct opposition, the simple solutions of yesterday will not get us there. So, what is this protected audience API? Believe it or not, opaque as even that name is, the good news is they renamed it to that they renamed it to protected audience API from what it was before, which of course begs the question, renamed it from what? Okay, recall that earlier um, that they abandoned Flock, F L O C which stood for Federated Learning of Cohorts. In a similar vein, the Protected Audience API was originally named Fledge. And <laughs> that was a painful, you know, they won't give up on these birds. <laughs> it was a painful reverse-engineered acronym which stood for First Locally Executed Decision Over Groups Experiment. Oh, that's awful. Oh, my God, yeah. <laughs> That's really bad. Okay, now, not exactly a catchy name. You know, where is the director of naming things when you need them? Because nerds should not name things, clearly. Okay, and what you're really not going to believe is that Fledge grew out of a project named Turtle Dove. I, I kid you not. And, yes, Turtle Dove was also an acronym short for Two uncorrelated requests, then locally executed decision on victory. <laughs> oh, oh, God, that's terrible. I, it's really bad. They're <laughs> it's only worse missing. And they're getting worse. They're only missing a word to provide the E at the end of dove. So excellent, <sighs> everlasting, or maybe excruciating. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Anyway, I was able to explain how topics worked. Since while it was a bit tricky and subtle, it was a relatively self-contained problem and solution. I don't have that feeling about this protected audience API because, as I noted earlier, they each only really make coherent sense when they're taken as a whole. So I'm not going to explain it at the same level of transactional detail. Okay, but, but I want to at least share some sound bites so that you can come away with some sense for what's going on here. And believe me, that will be enough. So at the start of Google's Protected Audience API Explainer page, it opens with one sentence that needs to be taken absolutely literally. <laughs> okay, they start with on-device add auctions to serve remarketing and custom audiences without cross-site third-party tracking. Okay, on-device ad auctions. <laughs> wow. Okay, now, I don't expect anyone to understand in any detail what follows. I don't. So just let it wash over you, and you'll get some very useful feeling for what's going on. Google explains, and I have explains in air quotes, the protected audience API uses interest groups to enable sites to display ads that are relevant to their users. For example, when a user visits a site that wants to advertise its products, an interest group owner can ask the user's browser to add membership for the interest group. If the request is successful, the browser records the name of the interest group, for example, custom bikes, the owner of the interest group, which is a URL like bikesrus.example, and interest group configuration information to allow the browser to access bidding code an ad code and real-time data if the group's owner is invited to bid in an ad auction. Okay, I know. Now, <laughs> just let your head spin. It'll be okay. So there's a feeling of the way Topics works here. The key is that the user's browser visits a site like Custom Bikes. 
and because their browser is at that site, thus the user is, is implicitly expressing their interest in custom bikes, an advertiser on that site can ask the user's browser to collect and retain some information that might be used in the future if an ad from that advertiser will be displayed. Okay, now note, importantly, that the advertiser learns exactly nothing about the visitor to the site. All of the information flow is into the user's browser and only because the website they're visiting. Okay, now Google and I continue. I because I had to fix this language <laughs> to even give us a hope of understanding it. So I, this is, I've clarified this. So they said, later, when the user visits a site with available ad space, the ad space seller, either a seller side provider or the site itself, <clears throat> can use the protected audience API to run a browser side ad auction, which will select the most appropriate ads to display to the user. The ad space seller calls the browser's new, there, there's a function, navigator.runadauction function, to provide the browser with a list of interest group owners who are invited to bid. Bids can only be provided by interest groups that the browser already became a member of when it had previously visited a website where it was able to collect that group and when the owners of those interest groups had been invited to bid. Bidding code is retrieved from a URL provided in the interest group's configuration that was received earlier. This code, which is JavaScript, provides data about the interest group and information from the ad seller, along with contextual data about the page and from the browser. Each interest group pr provided, uh, each interest group providing a bid is known as a buyer. When the visited site's JavaScript calls the new browser function to run the ad auction, each buyer's bidding code generates a bid with the help of real-time data provided by their protected audience key value service, whatever that is. Then the advertising space seller receives these bids as well as seller-owned real-time data and scores each bid. The bid with the highest score wins the auction. The winning ad is displayed in a fenced frame which is one of those new APIs, which absolutely prevents it from having any interaction with anything else anywhere. The ad creatives URL is specified in the bid and the origin must match one in the list provided by the interest groups configuration, that same information that was received earlier. Finally, the advertising space seller can report the auction outcome with a function known as report result and buyers can report their auction wins with a new function, report win. Okay, and finally, a bit later, Google offers a bit more detail, writing, in the protected audience API, an ad auction is a collection of small JavaScript programs. The browser runs on the user's device to choose an ad. To preserve privacy, all ad auction code from the seller and buyers is run in isolated JavaScript worklets that cannot talk to the outside world. A seller, a publisher or a supply side platform, initiates a protected audience ad auction on a site that sells ad space, such as a news site. The seller chooses buyers to participate in the auction, indicates what space is for sale, and provides additional criteria for the ad. Each buyer is the owner of an interest group. The seller provides the browser with code to score bids, which includes each bid's value, the ad creative URL, and other data returned from each buyer. 
during the auction, bidding code from buyers and bid scoring code from the seller can receive data from their key value services. Once an ad is chosen and displayed in a fenced frame to preserve privacy, the seller and the winning buyer can report the auction result. Okay, now, if all of this sounds insanely complex, you're right. This is not your grandpa's third-party cookies anymore, nor are our web browsers simple apps running on our chosen OS to display HTML code. Those are the days that are long gone and they're not coming back. It should now be abundantly clear to everyone that what Google has done with this privacy sandbox is to radically transform our web browsers from passive displays of whatever page is sent to them into proactive advertising management engines. All of this new technology is already built into Chrome and has been there for the past six months. Does all this probably give Sir Timothy John Berners-Lee, the web's original inventor, a huge headache? I would not at all be surprised. I would not be at all surprised if it did. Nothing less than an incredible mess is required to deliver interest-driven advertising to users without revealing anything about those users to their advertisers. And by the way, an incredible mess, as I said earlier, was the runner-up title for today's podcast. A large part of what I want to convey here is that nothing short of this level of complexity is required to protect our privacy while providing what the websites we depend upon and want unpaid access to say they need. Now, the nature of inertia means that we would never, and I really mean never, move from the absolute mess we're in today to this new promised land were it not for a behemoth like Google to first carefully design and craft this solution, doing so openly and in full public view, inviting collaboration and industry participation at every step of the way as they have. And secondly, to then literally force it down the closed choking throats of the rest of the existing advertising technology industry by taking Chrome, their world domineering browser, and gradually deprecating and foreclosing upon the operation of all of the previous tricks and techniques that have historically been used for user tracking and compromising users' privacy in the service of advertising tech. No one else could do this but Google. This is not something where consensus could ever have been reached. It would never happen. It would be committee deadlock. I've looked at the various ad tech blogs, and they're all screaming and pulling their hair out over this. But they're all also busily conducting experiments and getting ready for what they too understand is already inevitable. Notice that one of the things Google has done with this reconceptualization of web advertising is to move the advertising auctioning process away from the advertiser and into the browser. Traditionally, an advertiser would purchase real estate on the web on website pages. Then they would run their own real-time auctions to determine which of their many advertising clients' ads should be inserted into that space for any given visitor, given everything that the advertising seller knows about the visitor from tracking them across the Internet. This changes all of that. Now, all of the work is being done on the client side rather than on the server end. And doing this starves advertisers of all the data they were previously collecting while convincingly arguing against their having um, any further need to ever collect anything. In this new world, advertisers 
place static purchase offers to display content on website real estate with whatever ads they have to display, organized by interest group. Using Google's new APIs, browsers that had previously visited websites representing various interest groups are now able to collect the advertiser's material that will later be needed to display ads for those interested. Then later, when browsers visit other websites with sell offers behind available advertising real estate, all of the information about the offers flows into the browser, which then itself conducts the auction and selects the ad that is most relevant to its user based upon the places the browser has visited during the past few weeks. The results of the auction are returned to all interested parties and the ad tech company pays a piece of the action or of the auction to the site that offered up the real estate. In something of a follow-up, Google explains, quote, understanding user interests can enable more relevant ads than just choosing ads based on site content, contextual targeting, or by using information provided to, by a user to the site on which the ad appears, first-party ad targeting. Traditionally, ad platforms have learned about user interests by tracking their behavior across sites. Browsers need a way to enable ad platforms to select relevant ads so content publishers can get ad revenue without cross-site tracking. The Protected Audience API aims to move the web platform closer to a state where the user's browser on their device, not the advertiser or ad tech platforms, holds the information about what that person is interested in. And that states it perfectly, I think. The way the entire web advertising world has worked until now is that every advertiser had to collect all of the information they possibly could about every individual who was surfing the Internet for the sole purpose of selecting the best advertisement to show them. The result was massively intrusive, massively redundant, and an ultimately ineffective utilization of resources. But in the new world of Google's privacy sandbox, it's the user's browser that collects the information about its own user's interests by watching them navigate the web. As the browser moves around the web, future advertising, op advertising opportunities are collected by the browser. And later, when visiting a site that is offering some available advertising space, the browser itself runs an auction on the fly to decide which of the opportunities it previously collected should be presented to its user based upon the criteria that it solely maintains. This is obviously a big deal. But what seems just as obvious is that no lesser of a deal would get this important job done right. We can argue, and we'll always be able to argue, we certainly know that the EFF will always argue, that all website user-driven advertising customizations should simply be ended, and that advertisers should settle for, context for contextual advertising, placing their ads on sites which are offering content that's relevant and related to their ads just like in the pre-tracking days. Unfortunately, multiple studies have shown that this would reduce website advertising revenue by about half. And many websites are barely making ends meet as it is. So the EFF's ivory tower stance is simply not practical, and it's never going to happen. The only way to permanently end tracking is for it to be flatly outlawed. But tracking will never be outlawed while the case can be made that advertising customization is the only thing that's keeping today's web alive and financed and that there's no alternative to tracking and compiling 
interest profiling dossiers on everyone using the internet. So what Google has done is to create a practical and functioning alternative. Tracking is no longer necessary. User privacy is preserved. And once this new system has been established, we can anticipate that we will finally see legislation from major governments, probably with Europe taking the lead, which will flatly and without exception outlaw any and all internet user profiling and history aggregation because it will no longer be required. Google's Privacy Sandbox masterpiece has been in place, as I've said several times, for the past six months. And although they've already been kicking and screaming, all other serious advertisers have been exploring it in anticipation of the future, which appears to be all but certain. As we move into 2024, fingerprinting will become increasingly fuzzy and Chrome's third-party cookie support will be gradually withdrawn from its ubiquitous web browser. And finally, once the dust settles on all this, we can anticipate the end of the annoying cookie permission request pop-ups. We are you're heading right. <laughs> toward a brand new web. Do you think that, uh, like Manifest V3, this will be adopted by other browsers uh, at some point? Although, as you yes. pointed out earlier, Google has complete dominance in the. They have the, complete the dominance. Usage. Not only them, but but all Chromium. So really, it's Safari and Firefox that are yeah. the, 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 that are the remaining wild cards. Yeah. And this, I mean, this, this is what Google is going to do. I think they've nailed it. You know, they, they have a, a, a solution. I mean, and the way they've nailed it is by massively burdening the browser. Well, I, like, I'm going to say that is that I'm my system is now working really hard to deliver ads. Yep. <laughs> it just makes, uh, by the way, good news is to be very easy to block. Uh, yes. And in fact, you can opt out of this. Oh, if, can you? If, oh, absolutely. The, there is a, a user-facing API oh. that lets you just say no. Okay. Google knows That's most smart. people will not say no. Right. And I will not say no. Right. If, 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 my, if, if, if my use of the web is now private and my browser is selecting the best ads for me to see, which are retur is returning the highest amount of revenue to the websites I'm visiting, it is a win-win-win. It's really I mean, an interesting idea. It's a great solution in terms of, you know, protecting your privacy. Yes, it sure. turns yeah. the entire model on its yeah. head. And and the fact is, today's, I mean, it, you know, once upon a time, a browser was a little HTML rendering engine. Yeah. You know, now it's a, it is literally a behemoth. I mean, Well, that's one of the things that bothers me is now the, I mean, the browser is going to be 90% of your CPU pretty soon. It will. Yeah. I mean, it's uh, it. Although it is little lightweight scripts, and we know that Google is fr is a yeah, has a frenzy about performance, right. right? You know, and 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 how quickly the, the, this all displays. Here's where Tim Berners Lee might actually like this. He's been working toward uh, a solution where you control your own data. You know that your data is yours, and then you lease it out in effect to people, which this is basically an implementation of. So it fits right into what Tim Berners Lee has been doing of late. Yeah. So I think that it's possible Google may have found a way to give what we would like. Our holy grail would be for us to control and for our own information about ourselves, and then have the opportunity, if we wish, to share it, but at a price. You know that we get something out of it. Well, and that, I mean, this is a step toward that. As far as I know, there is no sharing opportunity. What there is in the UI is you can even browse the interest group yeah, that yeah. your browser See what you're has saying. Has, yes. Yeah, what it's saying. And, and and if you object to any, you're able to delete them and you're able to mark them as never come back if yeah. you really don't want it. It's interesting. No, they've they've really they've nailed this. Yeah. I mean and and this is where they're going and we know who they are.
So and and their browser. It's, it's funny too because I, you know, we've given a lot of space to the notion of fingerprinting. I think because it's kind of a cool technology. Mm-hmm. Everybody is still using cookies. Cookies yeah. is and and so when Google talks about right now as as as, as of the beginning of the year, one percent of their users have third party cookies turned off, and they're going to be. You know, they're doing that as an initial experiment, and then they're going to be deprecating the rest of third cookies. There will be no more third-party cookies by the by the middle that's of this huge. year. That's huge. That's so and good. It is, yeah. And now, so that's what's got the advertisers screaming and thinking, well, you know, we liked knowing all this about people, but we're going to have to fall in line. This is the future. Yeah. It is the future. And it really is a response to uh, widespread ad blocking uh, the cookies and other GDPR requirements. Uh, yeah, I think it's interesting. Let's see what happens. They've they've thrown so many ideas up against the wall. None of them have stuck. This might be the one. It does solve the problem. I yeah. see nothing wrong with it. Yeah. Good. Thank you for filling us in. The Protected Audience API. Terrible name, but an inter <laughs> very interesting concept. Yeah. Your browser is the one that yeah, that and even privacy sandbox. I mean, that doesn't yeah. tell you anything. No, like you know, don't kick sand in my eyes. Good. We'll talk about it tomorrow with Jeff. Cool. Yeah. Thank you, Steve. As always, uh, security now must listen every Tuesday. Right? We record the show Tuesday right after Mac Break Weekly, about one thirty Pacific, four thirty Eastern, twenty one thirty UTC. Uh, when we go live, uh, when we start recording, we'll go live on YouTube, youtubecom slash twit. So you can watch if you want while we're doing it. Uh, of course, club members get special access. They 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 get twenty four seven access to uh, all of our shows and Steve and even shows we don't put out in public. The club is more and more important as a way of going forward of us uh, monetizing because advertisers, uh, you know, they honestly, especially Security Now listeners, but they, they love them and they hate them. They love them because. You guys are the ones making all the ad, uh, rather the uh, uh, technology buying decisions in your companies. So they think you're great. I mean, they're really crazy about you. At the same time, you're also the ones running ad blockers. <laughs> you're the ones they can't really reach. Uh, and uh, and maybe that's why this protected API is the, uh, is the right way to do it. Um, but what we would like to offer you is a chance to support Twit on uh, this show and all our shows directly by joining the club. Twit.tv slash club twit. It's seven bucks a month. You get ad free versions of this show and all of our other shows. You also get access to our Discord so you can chat along with the show while you're watching it. You get uh, shows we don't put out anywhere else. Uh, but you really also get the warm and fuzzy feeling that you're helping us uh, do, I think, what is a very important job filling you in on what's happening in technology, thanks to people like Steve. If you are interested, please, twit.tv slash club twit. And I thank you in advance for your support. While you're over there, Take the survey. It's really important that everybody, uh, every show gets well represented in the survey uh, so that we know, you know, what you want as opposed to what people listening to the other shows want. Twit.tv slash survey24. It'll take you a couple of minutes. It's a lot shorter this year. It's very easy. It's the only thing we do once a year to kind of figure out what your interests are. So if you get a chance, please, twit.tv slash survey24. 24. Thank you for that as well. Steve's website is grc.com. When you get there, you'll find all of his great tools, including the world's best mass storage maintenance and recovery utility, Spinrite 6. Big announcement next next week. I got my fingers crossed. It's possible. Mine, believe me, mine are everything's crossed. <laughs> I, I can't walk. <laughs> if you buy, let's here's the good news. If you buy 6 one, uh, 6 0 now, you'll get 6 1 for free when it comes out, the minute it comes out. Uh, so definitely check that out. Steve also has the show. In fact, he has two unique versions of the show. Of course, he has a 64 kilobit audio, the same audio we have. But he has 16 kilobit audio, so it's a much smaller f file size. What is that, one-fourth the size, something like that? So so by doing that, uh, he makes it easy for you to download if you're in a bandwidth-impaired situation. He's even got a smaller version, which is the text version of the show. Yeah, human-written, not AI-generated, human-written transcript of this show and every show he's done. So there's a, it's very useful for searching, uh, reading along as you listen, or if you don't have time to listen, just reading the show notes. It's all at grc.com. 
Go to twit.tv slash sn for the 64 kilobit audio or the video. That's our unique version. Or go to YouTube. There's a dedicated channel to security now where the video is. That's great for sharing little clips. And, of course, the probably the best way to get the show. Make sure you don't miss a single episode. Subscribe on your favorite podcast player. You'll get it automatically as soon as we finish it on a Tuesday evening. Uh, and you can have it for your Wednesday morning commute or, or listen at your leisure whenever you want. Just look for security now wherever finer podcasts are aggregated and distributed via RSS. Steve Gibson, GRC.com. Thank you, sir. Have a wonderful week. I'll be back in studio next week for another gripping, thrilling edition of Security Now. <laughs> See you then, my friend. Bye. Hey, I'm Rod Pyle, Editor-in-Chief of Ad Astra Magazine, and each week I join with my co-host to bring you This Week in Space, the latest and greatest news from the final frontier. We talk to NASA chiefs, space scientists, engineers, educators, and artists, and sometimes we just shoot the breeze over what's hot and what's not in space books and TV. And we do it all for you, our fellow true believers. So whether you're an armchair adventurer or waiting for your turn to grab a slot in Elon's Mars rocket, join us on This Week in Space and be part of the greatest adventure of all time. Secure.